Hey, welcome back. I guess you had more questions, huh? Well, great. I have more answers. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Welcome to, yet again, the inaugural episode of Rob Explains Everything. I'm going to go into a little bit about me, a little bit about the show, and then we'll get into the topic today, defunding the police, reforming the police, and uh, what society kind of needs to do to address some of those problems. So first up, this is now the fourth inaugural episode of Rob Explains Everything. Uh, I had imagined this concept several years ago to be short explainer videos, and I still may focus a little bit on that. But uh, I found that most topics I wanted to dive into were too complicated to explain in five or ten minutes, like defunding the police or systemic injustice, systemic racism, institutional racism. Really hard to wrap that up in five minutes because it's, you know, 500 years of history or more. So uh, I went back to the drawing board and figured out, let's do something a little different. Let's create a radio show version of the Rob Explains Everything where people can call in, they can ask questions, uh, you can leave a comment for me and I can answer that. And we're going to cover a certain topic every single episode, stick to that one topic and try to keep it to, you know, half hour, 45 minutes or so. And I'll have some special features here and there. Like today, we'll do a debut of the uh the Chain Vapor song, which got debuted in the last one, but nobody heard it. So uh, we'll get back to that in just a second. That's uh, basically the history of Rob Explains Everything. If you want a little more information about whether it's me or Rob Explains Everything or the Everyman movie reviews that I do uh, bi-weekly, you can find all of that at robertncheek.com, R-O-B-E-R-T-N-C-H-E-E-K.com. Uh, you can find links there to everything that I do, the books that have been published, uh, the videos, uh, the reviews, and now a sound cloud for all of the parodies and uh, now of course rob explains everything will be up there as well so um let's see four four years ago or so five years ago maybe now it's been a long time uh, i sat down around uh you know late october came up with the idea of rob explains everything and did a mm, a first version an episode zero if you will of rob explains everything and that was on um Guy Fawkes and explaining who Guy Fawkes was. And I tried to get to script it out to keep it to the allotted time. And let me tell you, it was difficult. Uh, it looks like it's scripted. It looks like I'm reading a script and I'm not an actor as much as I maybe pretend to be. So it's a little harder for me to uh, to read a script or memorize a script. Uh, and I didn't like it. So I let I don't know, two more years go by and we tried episode zero again this time you know, as episode one of Rob Explains Everything. That's actually available on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Rob Cheek, where you can find uh, the Guy Fawkes <laughs> episode one. Uh, it's a little bit better. Uh, it's a little bit more like this format where I have some explanations and uh, a friend of the show, Roberto, actually cuts in to do some definitions where I felt like there were some definitions that needed to be done. Still wasn't super happy with the format and they're really hard to get pumped out. It takes a lot of production value to get that up. Now, a radio show is something that I've always been interested in. Uh, in another life, in another time, maybe I would have gone into radio myself. Uh, I love podcasting. Those of you who follow you are, know that I've been on the OD Anthem podcast for the last five, six, six plus years now, 325 consecutive weeks of new episodes. That's the closest thing we get to radio, but it's not live. Uh, and there's something I really like about being live and taking questions and uh, being able to re react and, and to comments and uh, take questions and that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to try this new format and we're going to see how it goes. Uh, and if not, maybe we'll try something else down the road. God knows I have tried a lot of stuff when it comes to Rob Explains Everything. So as a reminder, you can give us a call in. You can be a part of the show. You call into 424-253-5606. That's 424-253-5606. Oh, six. That's a local number to uh, California, Los Angeles, California. I'm actually going to put that in all the chats, no matter where you're watching, that should pop up with a number at the bottom. Uh, you can call in. I can take you right here. You'll be recorded in uh, there for posterity with all your questions. Um, so let's get into the topic at hand today, which is, of course, police reform, defunding the police and what we can do as a society. Up first, let me say it has been 113 days since Breonna Taylor was murdered. And let's go out and celebrate this July 4th by arresting her killers who are all still walking free, despite the fact that they may or may not still be police officers and may or may not become police officers somewhere else. So 113 days is too damn long. Go out and arrest the killers of Breonna Taylor. Uh, that's my message number one for today. So uh, <laughs> message number two. 
Let's get into defunding the police. And this is a super controversial topic. I will tell you, it's got a lot. It's got a lot of things involved in it. We're going to dive into all of it. I hope you guys are ready. Uh, if you're watching along at home, make your comments, make your questions. I'm happy to address all of those. But Rob explains everything. Defunding the police. So this topic got a lot of traction, even on a video that had no audio. And that was unbelievably strange to me. There was an entire conversation in the comments of a muted video about defunding the police and how wrong I was. And I will say that most people are nah, not most. A couple of people in that conversation said, I, I didn't even listen to what you had to say. You're wrong on this. And that is exactly what's wrong with society today. If I can make one commentary of very many bouncing around in my head about society today, you don't inform yourselves. You don't hear other opinions. You assume you are right. I have said many, many times before that one of the lessons I learned on my shift from the political right to the political left was to listen more and to talk less. And people who know me may be astounded by that because I seem to talk a lot. But that being said, I've learned a lot by listening to everyone and trying to understand their point of view. It's a great mental exercise that I like to do. It's that's to take an opinion that's not my own and find a way to defend it. Because if you do that, you start to see what it is about that opinion that is appealing to other people. Most of the time, I, it's a, a it is a thought uh, experiment because it's really hard to get into that mentality where other people are. But uh, I, I find that it's worthwhile. I, I ask you guys to try that. Find something that you are absolutely against and then try to argue for that thing. And if you legitimately try to argue for it, you'll start to find all of the points of opinion that support that particular thing. And then when you flip back to the side you truly believe in, well, it makes it really easy to kind of go at those arguments because you can stay on topic. Here are the four things I know you're going to argue and hear why you are wrong about those things. Now, defunding the police is, of course, one of those topics. Uh, it has gotten a lot, a lot, a lot of play over the last few weeks uh, all over the place, social media uh, and in uh, mainstream media. Honestly, uh, you can find stories everywhere about defunding the police. And the question I get asked probably more than any other is what is defunding the police. And that is not a simple question. Honestly, there is a lot of little things that are involved in defunding the police. And it's a, it's, there's not one answer for everyone. I'll tell a little anecdote to kind of explain what I mean. So back in 2011, I was uh, a participant in uh, the Occupy movement. I went down to Occupy Baltimore and uh, I went and took place, took part uh, in the, the congresses that they had, the big group meetings where everything was decided uh, by committee. And, uh, you know, we literally took votes on anything that might happen around the entire uh, work site, campsite there and did it by everyone voting. And it's uh, one that's not a really good way to govern. I, I could tell you that. Um, and I tried to kind of shift that particular campsite from uh, open democracy, traditional democracy over to a representative democracy and uh, was kicked out for my troubles. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is because everyone had a different reason why they were there. Occupy meant something different to every single person at that campsite. And obviously I was there because I was young and idealistic. I can't believe to say that's nine years ago. Now, nine years ago, I was camping out there. I was a much younger man at that point. Uh, and uh, I was young and idealistic and I wanted to change the world. And I looked at Occupy as a start of a revolution, a political change that could actually bring about a different society. Now, as we know, that is not, in fact, what happened. Uh, it fell woefully short of that goal. Uh, and uh, maybe I'm glad I got kicked out um, or asked to leave. I don't know whether they would say I got kicked out. I got asked to leave. And I don't know whether or not uh, they would uh, agree with that, uh, with me doing that. I, I think at this point, it was probably the best thing that could have happened. Because once I realized they weren't going to make any progress, uh, the only thing I could do was to alienate myself. I did. I got asked to leave. So. But defunding the police is a complicated question. Uh, there are people, uh, I will say I am not of this variety, but there are people who say that defunding the police means eliminating the police as an entity in its entirety. And that is a, a drastic, drastic way to deal with the problem. There are other people who say, uh, why are we rewarding them with bigger budgets when they're not actually accomplishing anything? 
And so to them, to fund the police means let's roll back those huge budget budgets and let's find a way that we can, you know, address the problem. Uh, and once they fix, start fixing the problem, then we'll think about making their budgets a little bigger again. And that is, of course, a way to deal with it. Um And then, of course, there is a variety of things in between. The funding can mean anything from taking away some of your funding, that that latter portion I meant, to eliminating the police entirety, uh, the former, the first thing that I mentioned there. Uh, My beliefs are somewhat in the middle, but I'm going to try and cover a little bit of that entirety of an argument uh, and try to give you a perspective of where these people stand. So for many people who likely look like me, who have likely lived lives similar to me, your middle class, upper middle class, lower upper class, uh, white, mostly white, cis white, heterosexual cis white people, uh, they don't like a lot of change. Uh, I'm right working on a book right now. Uh, It's about societal change and how we can accomplish that. It was inspired years ago by Freddie Gray and the new revamp, of course, is inspired by all of the George Floyd uh, protests that are going on. And I... In that book, I basically make an argument why and how societal change comes. And it's got to be big. There has to be big movement. This thing that's happening around the country right now is a result of many, many things happening all at one time. Everyone being trapped inside for a while. There being no sport, no distractions, no sports, no uh, nothing going on in the news, really, except for what Trump is doing. And um all the protests that are going on. And so when our, when our singular focus can be placed on something like that, then yes, of course, we're going to pay attention to it. And it's, it's short lived, unfortunately, because eventually people are going to leave their homes. Eventually people are going to lose, lose patience. They're not that no one has the attention span anymore to pay attention to all of the details and keep track. Not even I, not even I have that kind of attention span, even though I wish that I did, of course. But, um, Societal uh, change requires a lot of big thinking, and I don't know that we're there now, but the I would say that this is why heterosexual the people like me uh, who are not like me politically, but are like me, maybe mentally, physically, um, they look for incremental change. Uh, These are the people who were telling during other people during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, like, I don't know why you're trying to rush things so fast, ignoring the previous 400 years that had come before that and just saying, hey, why are you pushing for so much so fast right now? Uh, it's insulting to it's honestly it's insulting for people to be treated that way. And we should avoid that. And but in order to reform police, they think that incremental change is the way to go. Let's take away some of their money, see if they change. If they don't, we'll take away more of their money. If they don't, we'll take away more of their money. If they start improving, then let's add money into the places where it's working. But that requires a lot of things. It requires oversight, which we know for certain police do not have in this country. It requires a consistency of leadership. Using the example of the Baltimore Police Department, which is the police department which which I'm probably most familiar, having lived in Baltimore for some time, uh, Corey and I, the other host of the, of the Anthem podcast, talk about the Baltimore Police pretty often. And uh, so I stay up to date on what's happening with them. They do not have consistency of leadership. Neither does the city, for that matter. Uh, and although Los Angeles is slightly different, they do keep a consistency of leadership. What we're talking about is big change that takes a long time time. And even at the federal level, we don't have that kind of leadership. Presidents are there for eight years and then they're gone. Yes, congressional leaders may be there for a very long time. Senate leaders are there for a long time, but it's always about moving up to the next thing. So if you are a city councilman here in Los Angeles, or if you're on the city council in Baltimore or New York or wherever it is that you live in this country, your congressman or your your city councilman are looking for the next thing, whether that's city council president, whether that's going for the mayorship, whether that's running for Congress, whether it's running for Senate, they're always looking to move on to something bigger and better. And when that's the case, these kind of long term changes are hard because you can hold one person accountable. But when they leave, uh, what's going to happen? Well, we got to put pressure on somebody new. And I'd like to think that the person going out would be replaced by a better person coming in. But we all know that's not how it worked. Uh, we were there for the election in 2016. So incremental change is difficult unless it's done through the judicial branch of government. Um, I, I'm going to put uh, in the show notes of this a link to a really great TikToker who does a video about the separation of powers, the three branches of government and who we should hold accountable for things. But in the end, the judicial branch is a branch we can lean on to make those incremental changes because 
they're going to be there. They're going to hear new cases. They're going to take on new things. But the judicial system as it is right now, the judicial branch is led by a largely conservative group. And Trump has appointed something like 144 federal judges who will be there for their entire lives. These are all problematic. My reason for explaining all of this is to say incremental change does not work. It doesn't work historically. It doesn't it, you never get where you need to be. So looking at incremental change as a solution for police reform or for defunding them is not a solution. That being said, let's go to the other extreme. The other extreme is to eliminate police altogether. Also in that book that uh, I am working on, I talk about the social contract. And a lot of people aren't familiar with this concept. I, listen, I have a political science degree from Hofstra. And I meant to do a little bit of background on me, but I assume everybody who's watching this knows who I am, knows my background. I have a, 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 a undergraduate degree in political science with a minor uh, focusing on the history of the Middle East, the modern Middle East. Uh, and I have a law degree from the University of Baltimore. I practiced law for five years, most of that being criminal defense, as well as some family law work. So I have a little bit of experience in this subject matter, let's say. Um, but that that push to eliminate the police. Uh, I talk about the social contract in that book. The social contract is an agreement that is unstated or stated between members of a, of a society. You, I, everyone who lives in the United States, we've agreed to the same social contract. We agreed to that social contract. Well, you and I didn't agree to it. The founding fathers agreed to that social contract because when they overthrew the previous government that was ruling them, they were able to install new institutions that basically reflected their beliefs and they then created a new social contract between one another. That social contract included that uh, any person of color was worth three fifths of a real person. That's in the Constitution. Go ahead and check it. Uh, they also said that women were not citizens. So when Thomas Jefferson wrote, uh, we find it to be self-evident that all men are created equal. What he really meant was men. He didn't mean humans. He meant men. And uh, white men, white landowning men. You know, uh, I, despite all of my relative success in my life, do not own a house. Uh, I like renting. I like the ability to leave and move and not be responsible for big expenses. So to Jefferson, I am not a true citizen of the United States. In his mind, despite being white, despite being you're relatively middle class, despite being relatively wealthy compared to most of uh, the United States. I don't own land and therefore I should not have a say in how the country is led. That is the social contract that was built between the founding fathers. Now, over time, we have uh, modified that social contract in the 1920s. The women got the vote. And then in the 1960s, the Voting Rights Act assured that every adult 18 and over has the franchise, the franchise, of course, being uh, the right to vote, the right to have a say in how the country is governed. So, whew, man, that was a lot. That's a light right off the top. We are whew, we're really getting into it here. So um, what I write in the book is that we have this social contract between one another, but there are always people who will break that social contract. And every every bit of literature agrees with me on this, that even out of 100 people, you know, out of 10 you take a random sampling of 10 people, you are likely to find 10 out of 10 people who essentially live by the social contract. These are people who don't murder someone, um, not because, you know, it's against the law, even though it is, but that can be, they believe morally that we should just treat each other the right way. That is more of the social contract. Laws are, are related to it, but that's not really it. It's about the agreement we reach amongst each other, that we're going to treat each other with respect, that everyone should be treated equally, no matter their sex or, or their gender or their race or uh, any of the beliefs that they have, where they're from, anything like that. We're going to treat everybody equally. So that social contract has been modified and eventually it's a, it's agreed upon by the majority of people and it kind of enters what we would call the status quo, the center. So right now, uh, I, I, wow, I said all of that to tell you about the, the very far uh, extreme of this defund the police movement, which is to eliminate police. And I find that to be very difficult because once you have a group of 10, you'll be able to randomly sample 10 people and get 10 out of 10 who agree to the social contract and live by it. But even just increasing that to 100, you are likely to find one person who does not believe that the rules apply to them. Uh, a Trump, if you will. Uh, or just, you know, your average criminal, not your above average criminal like Trump, but your average criminal uh, who, you know, not a guy who's running, you know, uh, running speeding. I don't care about that stuff. That That is nonsense crime. I just mean a guy who will steal from you if given the opportunity. 
Out of 100 people, any random sampling of 100, you're likely to find one. And the difficulty with defunding the police completely in the sense of eliminating the police as an agency is that you are going to have a rough time with those people. Now, I do not support the prison industrial complex. I do not support the criminal justice system as it stands where... People are incarcerated for long periods of time for crimes that do not deserve that. I don't like the idea of incarceration in general, but sometimes it's necessary. There are some people who need to be separated from the rest of us for the protection of everyone else so that we can live in a nice society. It doesn't matter what their race is, where they're from, where their parents were from, any of that. Oh, hey, happy 4th of July. Uh, It doesn't matter any of that. Um, What matters is there is something about this person that doesn't allow them to exist within the social contract. So uh, we need to to separate them. That's what a prison is for. And we need someone to police that behavior like the police. So defunding them completely doesn't make sense to me unless we're eliminating uh, them and creating something else. Now, I think a good example of this is what the Minneapolis police uh, are about to go through. So a veto uh, proof majority of the Minneapolis uh, City Council has said that within two years, they are moving to a new model for policing. They are eliminating the police 100 percent and then going and finding a new model. A few years ago, Camden, New Jersey did the same thing, uh, but a different version. They fired all of their police officers and then said, you need to interview to get your job back. And some of you are going to be rehired, but not all of you will. And they found that that was a good way to hit the reset button and try to get some real change going uh, in their uh, in their police department, in their city. So for them, that was a solution. I don't know that that is a solution for everyone, but Even Minneapolis, which has been kind of the most extreme of the defund the police when we see in actually the public sector, don't go as far as what we're hearing from some people about defunding the police completely and eliminating them and just not replacing them. Yeah, I I know that on a small basis, this idea works really well. When I was down at Occupy, we policed our our ranks pretty well. Uh, The new Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone uh, that had happened in Seattle before it was just brutally broken up by the Seattle PD and uh, federal forces, they policed themselves as well. And on a small model, that absolutely works. But as a society as a whole, it doesn't work. So we need to find a different way to do that. Now, uh, that kind of explains both the extremes. I want to get into what my belief is and what I want to do with uh, the revamp as a whole. I'm, I'm going to get into that. I do want to take just a second, catch my breath, get a little drink here. And then when I come back, I'm going to be back with my plan for how to reform the police and what defunding the police means to me. So hang out for me one second and I'll be right back with you. All right. And we are back. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Um, It's really hard to just do this by yourself. Uh, So help me out a little bit. Send a comment into uh, the discord. Uh, Send a comment on wherever you're watching. I'll be able to check all of those. And if you want to be on the show, it's super easy. Give me a call. 424-253-5606. That's 424-253-5606. Oh, six. I can play you right live here. We can go have a little banter back and forth. It's just like the radio shows you used to hear in the morning on the way to school. Uh, and it's probably the last time anybody actually listened to one of those. So now let's get into it. What is my plan for reforming society, for defunding the police, for all of those things? Well, my plan is a little bit uh, from column A and a little bit from column B. Uh, I do think that we need to absolutely and 100 percent check and get rid of most some of the police officers who are currently active policing as we speak. The police have been trained poorly. Uh, They have. Everybody's celebrating the fourth. Uh, They have uh, they have been led down. They've been led astray by the previous officers. And the problem with police departments is they're like traffic jams. You think of a traffic jam as a thing, but. While you move towards the jam spot and then are released afterward, that jam stays there. Bad police departments kind of operate in the same way. Officers come in and officers go out. But as long as there's a culture within that police department of treating people differently or, you know, um, acting a different way towards someone of a different race, and that is passed on to the new officers, that culture is never going to change. So we got to find a way to change that. My solution. Here we go. Step one. 
We're going to take the Canada, New Jersey approach and we're going to fire everyone all at once. And we're going to make them interview for their own jobs. That will let us get a more insight into the people who are actually going in, the people who are who want the job as a police officer. And it gives us an opportunity to open it up to people from all over and say, hey, would you like to come in and help us reform this police department with a mindset towards this is how we are doing things now. If you're not OK with it, you are not going to be a member of our police department. I want to tie this in with a couple of different things that I think are going to be necessary. First. We have to de-empower the police unions. Right now, the police unions have an ungodly amount of power. And my leftist holdings otherwise, all of, I, I would never think that I would be the person making the argument that we need to make unions less powerful. But here we are. There are some unions who need to be less powerful. A teacher's union needs to be less powerful. The police union needs to be less powerful. These groups have an immense impact on day to day life for the people who come into contact with them. Teachers, it's, you know, students and parents also doesn't apply to me, but police that does apply to me, uh, although I don't come into contact with them very often. We need to get back the directional that the, the police are defending the members of their union. I and I want that to happen, but I want them to defend the good members and not the bad members. So we have to put in protections to make sure that no matter what, Bad officers can get off the force and out of the union and that the good officers are then able to be protected by the union. That's the whole point of the union. So uh, in conjunction with firing everyone and making them re-interview for their own jobs, number one, a federal, that means a national database of police officers and maybe not just police officers as a whole, but at least use of force incidents. I want to know that the guy I'm hiring here in my city has had a previous use of force complaint in the last five departments that he has worked in. He worked in all of those departments for two years. In each of them, he picked up four use of force incidents every single year before he left and or was fired and or left because in lieu of being fired and then moved on to the next police department. And now I'm the next one. I'm going to be the one holding the bag when he beats somebody and the city has to pay a civilian for that unlawful use of force. So I want to be able to search a database and find all of those complaints in one place. And if it's only available to the towns and cities who are doing the hiring, that's fine. I prefer public databases. What do you have to hide anyway? Right? So Make it a database that is searchable, at least by the towns and the cities, if not a public database where anyone can look up any officer and find out what use of force they have been accused of and what was the results of that hearing. After we have a searchable database of police officers, I would also, and of course, uh, keeping in mind, firing everybody, they're going to apply for their own jobs. Uh, we de-empower the police unions by ending the collective bargaining agreements and then re-bargaining for a more powerful position. Uh, and we create a national database with all these forces and incidents. Another thing that we need to do is to require police officers to carry their own insurance coverage. This is a check and balance on all of the other things that I have mentioned, because the insurance companies are not in the habit of paying out money when they don't have to. So at some point, an officer will have caused so much, so many problems that they become uninsurable by any insurance looking to provide officer insurance or, you know, police officer, uh, whatever insurance. Once they become uninsurable, they can no longer become a police officer because every department should require that that officer carry their own liability coverage. That liability coverage is also what pays out when that officer inv is involved in a use of force incident, unless it is shown that the use of force incident was within the protocol set up out by the department. Then of course the department's uh, holding the bag. This will also make us look at our entire police department and say, what are we training these officers on? What are the policies? And maybe we should go back in and make some changes. That's already happening all across the country. Uh, the kind of holds the neck holds the uh, carteroid holds, carteroid holds as they're called on the carteroid artery. They are outlawing those. Uh, when can a baton come out? When can a gun come out? When can a, a, a stun gun come out? They're looking at all of these policies. And a lot of departments are saying, if you draw anything from your belt, you're going to have some paperwork associated with it. So be careful, because if we see that that's happened, I expect to see a report about it. Those are all things that are going to be important moving forward. We need to have accountability. And if the police department has the best policies in place, and there is still a use of force incident. Well, now the city, the taxpayers are not forced to bear the burden of whatever that cost is. Now, your insurance, Mr. Police Officer, is going to pay out. And eventually, no insurance company, once it's paid out enough on your behalf, will want to cover you. 
And when that happens, you better find a new line of work. And that is the goal. The goal is for all of you bad applers out there, the ones who say, oh, it's most cops are good. It's just a few bad apples. Well, this will get those bad apples out, right? If they can't get insurance, they're going to be pushed out of the department. And that's what we think the goal is. That's what I think your goal is anyway, right? So if that's the goal, this can accomplish it. Let's get that insurance. Let's look at our policies, all of these steps. Now, um, when it comes to the defunding portion, uh, and I've kind of said about how we would do a better job at setting up a police department. How are we going to deal with funding? Well, m all of that that I've listed, uh, all of those officers are two sections of four sections of what I would consider new policing. They're the last two. They're also the smallest two. So what I propose is this, that we take for the last year, the last two years, the last five years, and we look at 911 calls and we say, as a result of the call or whatever the report was that came from that call, how can we categorize that? What you'll find if you do that kind of examination is that the majority of those calls are for people who have a disagreement with their neighbors that could be better handled by a mediator or someone in a mental health crisis that could be better handled by mental health professionals. Very few, very few of those 911 calls. Would be, would it would be needed to send out an armed police officer to. So once we look at the last two, one, two, five years, and we put all of those calls into categories, now we're going to take the police budget as it stands, and we're going to divide that up, and we're going to assign it to different departments by calls. And we'll keep this running into the future. If we find that one needs more, one needs less, let's move that money around. But it will allow us to put the money into the sub-department where it can do the most good. And this is how I would structure the sub departments. The first, the largest would be members of the community who are mediators, who can diffuse situations, who can get that emotionality down. I want those kind of people on the streets uh, in Oregon. Uh, I think it's Salem, Oregon. I might be Portland, Oregon. They have a group called cahoots. And what this do group does is it's trained professionals who go out on a call and they try to deescalate a situation and they try to get information and then they try to set up after care services. They do things for which there is no need to have an armed police officer. If my neighbor and I are having a disagreement and this is the fourth time I have to call the cops about the loud noise at uh, in his house. First of all, I shouldn't be calling the cops about that. Yes, it's a law to keep the noise up, but in the end, this is a disagreement between people and there needs to be a discussion about how I, on my property, can enjoy, qu have quiet enjoyment of my property while you, on your property, can do the things that you want to do as well. And how can we accomplish those goals? There is no need to bring a gun and an untrained person into this situation. The likelihood that the other party or myself, let's be honest, because I say a lot of inappropriate and probably uh, disturbing things uh, if my mother was to hear them uh, to police officers in general. So we create a new, very large section of the community uh, of community services. Let's use cahoots as the example. There are mediators. They are uh uh, you know, uh, not necessarily psychiatrists and psychologists, but uh, and not mental health professionals, social workers, people who are trained to do this and they can deescalate the situation. They can bring us back to zero and then follow up with aftercare, follow up with after actions to try and get the the whatever the dispute causes dispute settled rather than having someone come in as an arbiter, the cop in this point and say, you're right, you're wrong. Go to your corners. Because in the end, that is not going to stop the continuing disagreement. It's going to stop it right now. But that agree disagreement is going to continue. So let's get some people in there who can bring about final decisions, who can mediate and make us come to an understanding and then have success and peace in the future rather than just for the next few hours. The second group. Uh, I said psychiatrists and psychologists earlier. I said I don't want them in that first group because I want them in this second group. The second group is mental health professionals on the street. A lot of calls that the police are sent out to are about people who are in distress, um, whether they're threatening to harm themselves or to harm others, or they're being just a nuisance on the street. A lot of those are down, come down to mental health issues manifesting in a society where we have made mental health care 
not a priority, a very, very low priority if you judge by budgeting, which I think is the number one way to see what does society care about this issue? How much money do we put to it? Because right now it looks like we put a lot of faith in racism, institutionalized, um, system, systemic racism, um, murdering people of color for doing everyday things. Uh, I mean, there is a Twitter I love, a Twitter account that just lists the, all the things that black people can't do in America. You can't hold a toy gun in a store. You can't hold it, hold a toy gun in a park. You can't hold a toy gun on a train. You can't hold it in a train station. You can't have it in your car. You can't have a legally licensed firearm in your car. These are all reasons why police across the country have murdered black people for things that are not illegal. And I'm not going to get into the, the what's legal versus illegal. And especially the cases where maybe the officer was justified. I don't care. You know, it's not justified. What happened 113 days ago when police on a no knock warrant busted down the door and when the homeowner thinking he was, you know, being robbed, shot at the intruders who didn't announce themselves and they returned fire, killing his wife, who was an EMT. Of course, I'm talking about Brianna Taylor and her murderers are still on the street 113 days later. So let's go out and arrest the murderers of Brianna Taylor and get some justice for her, shall we? All right. So back to the topic. Um, that, that is what is illegal and drawing the line. I don't care about any of that. In the end, most of the calls that, that uh, police go out on are disturbance calls between that can be settled out by mediation or mental health calls. So the largest portion of the money goes to the largest group, which are these community mediators, the cahoots, if you will. The next group is psychiatrists, psychologists, other social workers uh, with professional degrees, those who are used to dealing with people in mental health stress, those who are under distress and those who are having breakdowns and, you know, diffuse the situation again, not bringing a gun to a situation that is already highly, highly emotional. So once that we have that group established too, now we've eliminated in my, by my estimation, 70 to 80% of the work that the police do. And we've put that work in the hands of people who are more qualified to do it. And that the, the Instances we see of people saying, I'm going to kill myself and then being killed by the police, which defies, it defies logic to me to say, if I threaten to kill myself, that somehow that ends with the cop murdering me and somehow that's okay, you know, because I was going to kill myself anyway, right? So, yeah. And, you know, there are a lot of issues that that build up to this. And I'm not I don't want to just jump over them, but I have to because our topic today is about defunding the police and police reform. And in the end, we can't get to the number of firearms on the street, how easy it is to get firearms some places and not other places. The lack of testing, the lack of licensing, the lack of everything in our society when it comes to firearms, the lack of mental health care. Generally speaking, I have decent insurance and I can get mental health care, but not a lot of people do. And especially those who now coming out of this pandemic who don't have jobs, who don't have insurance, because somehow insurance is still a thing that we can make a profit off of, which also defies logic. There are things that we should not make money off of police, fire, medicine. These are all things. And we found that the, in our history, we found the time that we made the police a social welfare. We made fire firemen a social welfare, and we need to make medicine a social welfare. So we can start focusing on treating people and having a better society and not on making money off of sickness. But I digress. We have the cahoots people who are mediators in the public. We have psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers who are trained in situations of stress for people in mental health, um, having mental breakdowns. And that is the 70 to 80 percent of the budgets and 70, 80 percent of the people. And what I envision is that much like policemen, these people would be assigned to neighborhoods. The neighborhood I lived in, I would love to see my community mediator out and about on the street meeting people, going into shops, finding people and just saying, Hey, you know, this is who I am. This is where you can reach me. Uh, if you have a problem, you can call 911, just tell them, you know, I need my community mediator out here. And by the way, another thing that has changed and is changed. Uh, I think Austin, it might be Dallas. It might be Austin, Texas. Now, when you call in, there are three options. Do you need fire, uh, fire medical? Do you need police or do you need mental health? And they will send out a group just to address mental health issues. Like if they think the person's just going having like some sort of mental health issue, don't send to the police, ask for mental health workers and they will come out there. 
but I want our community mediator to be out and about. I want them to be the beat cop that we used to see back in the day. The one walk in the neighborhood who gets to know everybody who knows when someone's there, who isn't, you know, from the neighborhood. Uh, and you know, not that we're going to ostracize people from neighborhoods, but that they get to know the people and they know that Mrs. Johnson and Mrs. Smith who live next to each other, you know, they're 70 year old women with not a lot to do. And they just always are at each other. And if I have a problem with Miss Johnson, I want that guy or that gal or that man or that woman or that person to know, oh, well, listen, if you're involving Mrs. Johnson, that inevitably involves Mrs. Smith. And I want to make sure that we're not treating one with favoritism because that's going to have problems for the other. And that causes problems for the whole neighborhood. And being that involved with your community it has nothing but positive results. And maybe it's two or three of them who work a bigger neighborhood network, but they're all going around and meeting people and being in the community. Be the beat cops that we used to have. Mental health, a little bit different, but they cover less of them and they cover a little bit larger area. But certainly I would love to see these folks going out to AA meetings and NA meetings and going out and, and meeting with the homeless community and trying to offer services and like, no, I'm not a cop. Nothing is going to happen to you. I just want to make you the best version of you. I want you to be able to be the best version of you possible. And I want to help you any way that I can. And here are the services that are available because we've gotten such a huge influx of money because the billion dollars, billion with a B that Los Angeles currently pays towards police or the half a billion, again, half a billion with a B that Baltimore spends on police or the multiple billion that New York spends on police is now being divided up and that money is being made available for mediation programs, for after school programs, for mental health programs, for everything that actually benefits the community and not to put a tank in the hands of a bully from high school who stopped emotionally maturing at 17 and is looking for an opportunity to flex on you. So we've covered the first half. That's 70 to 80%. I'm going to get into the second half, which is the, uh, what we would think of as policing today, only much smaller and with much less power. Before I do that though, I did promise people I was going to do a debut of the song, I did it last time, but apparently the audio is muted. So uh, I do want to do a debut of the song. Before I do, what I will say is this. Um, it's a rough version. Uh, all of these are rough. I do this because it's fun. I love the idea that I can sit down with a song as it currently exists, write a parody version of it, and then record it. And we have that done in the matter of a few hours. Uh, not, you know, a few days or a few months, which is how most of my projects or never, which is what, what most of my projects uh, end up being. So I hope you enjoy it. It was a lot of fun to do. Uh, I roped Roxy into this one. Uh, Corey, of course, uh, other half of the o, the Anthem um, podcast helped out with the recording. So uh, we actually have two versions of this. I'm going to play what we would call the public version, which was Corey's cut of the version. But if you go to robertandcheek.com forward slash further, that's F-U-R-T-H-E-R. You can hear both versions, both my version and Corey's version on SoundCloud or YouTube, and you can vote. Let us know which your favorite version is, and that way we can find out who's got the better ear for music these days. But without further ado, we're going to go into the song debut. It is Further by The Chain Vapors featuring Smallsy. Uh, and we'll be right back with more Rob Explains Everything right after that. All right, and we are back. Thank you guys for hanging out with me this long. Once again, you can call in. Let me hear your comments and questions. 424-253-5606. That's 424-253-5606. You can comment wherever you're watching. Oh, let me turn that off. Had the AC back on for a second while you're uh, away from there. So uh, again, uh, you can reach me wherever you are on Twitch, on Facebook, uh, on YouTube. Make a comment right there. I can see it uh, in the Discord. Or you can join the Discord directly. Uh, ask me, and we can get you in there uh, for the next episode. So... Wrapping up right now, what we are talking about is the last two smaller bits. We talked about cahoots, the mediators. We talked about the medical me mental health professionals. 70 to 80% of all calls are for those. That's what's going to get covered with 70 or 80% of the budget. When I say defund the police, what I mean is to take 70 or 80% of the current funds associated with them and move them into those two programs. And then leaving 20 to 30% for what we're about to talk about now. That is the 
police as you traditionally see them, those guys in cars riding around, uh, I want those guys to stay because I think there are times when we need them. But the one thing, and I've kind of harped on it a little bit, uh, is that we need them to not have firearms. You never, should, there are situations where we don't need to bring a firearm into this situation. So I took inspiration from the United Kingdom and kind of how they have their police set up for my last two sections. Although it will be the biggest part of the police, it will be a much smaller part than the other ones we previously discussed. Those police will still exist. And I would love to have them working beats the way that they have done traditionally. Get out of the car, get back on the street. Now, yeah, we need to have shops. They need to be able to get around if they need to get around. But I think for the most part, if you can have them walking around the neighborhoods that they serve and say, hey, you are always assigned to this neighborhood and you should get to know the people who live there, get to know the people who own the shops, get to know the faces of the people who are around. And that way you can feel like part of the community and maybe just maybe when you're off duty and when you're coming in from Lancaster or coming in from where Victorville, wherever it is you live here in L.A. or when you're driving in from York to the city of Baltimore, because let's be honest, that's where a lot of BPD officers work. I'm sorry, where they live. Um then maybe you'll feel like, hey, I'm going to go see that shop owner. That guy just opened up a new taco stand. I want to go support that because I like that guy. And I'm going to go support and be a part of my community, not just with the badge on, but also with the badge off. But I take the inspiration from the UK because we're going to take the guns out of the hands of these officers. And I'm not just saying the regular firearms, the Berettas, the Glocks, whatever it is that they're carrying. I'm talking about most of the what we consider firearms. Because there's been a lot of talk recently uh, since the protests have started about uh, non-lethal weapons. And that is a misnomer. Not, there is no such thing as a non-lethal weapon. A shotgun that fires a non-lethal round doesn't. The person who makes the company that makes that, that weapon, that round will call them a less lethal round because there is still a chance that that thing is going to kill you. You get struck in the chest with a rubber bullet. It can stop your heart and you can die. It can still penetrate the skin if fired close enough. And you know, at you. Um, it can hit you in the head and kill you. A beanbag fired at your chest or at your head can kill you. A lot of less lethal, not what they call non-lethal, but less lethal rounds will still kill you. And so they shouldn't be used as if they are non-lethal. They should be considered less lethal and still only used like a bullet in a situation where we would not want to use a bullet, but let's use something else. But there's a whole lot of situations outside of that where we shouldn't involve a bullet at all. Well, these police are going to be there for that. You know, uh, whether or not they have batons, I don't, you know, historically those batons have been used for nothing good and mostly bad. But I get the idea that uh, these officers are going to be kind of out on their own and they maybe need to protect themselves. A whistle, just like the UK, the old bobbies. You know, you've seen like a period piece from Victorian uh, era England and the cops are all running around and they blow the whistle and then that makes all the other cops rush over. I like that idea. And I think that one, having a whistle would be a good idea because overwhelming force can sometimes be the number of officers and not about what they have personally to use. I don't need a gun to have overwhelming force. If there's 10 of us, we have overwhelming force on most people. And also, by the way, most of those situations are people in mental distress or uh, a disagreement amongst neighbors for which we didn't need police and we've already eliminated them. So give them a whistle, uh, pepper spray, sure, um, maybe. Stun guns, maybe, and maybe for some officers, maybe those get taken away when you use them in an inappropriate way. Um, a baton, sure, maybe. These are all things that individual police departments and cities will have to discuss, so I'll leave it to them to decide. For me, I like the idea of the old school Bobby, just, you know, nothing but a broad shouldered young chap with a whistle. And if something happens, he whistles and a bunch of guys rush over or, you know, maybe the modern whistle, which is a radio um, and they can trigger the radio and a bunch of people show up. We have radio and GPS now, so it makes things super easy um, and you don't need weapons. We'll leave the weapons for the last section, the smallest section. Um, that subsection would be what they in the UK call armed police. There is assumption, no matter where you are in the United Kingdom, that if you see a police officer, he is not armed. He does not have a firearm of any type. I think that's changing somewhat. They are giving them small caliber weapons like United States. And I think that's moving the wrong direction, not the right direction. But let's just say that it's 1990, um, which, of course, I'm basically stuck in the 90s because I grew up through the 90s and that the, the British police officers have no guns. So, um... I first of all, they paint their cars in something that is bright and easy to see so I can see a cop, wave them down and get help. 
because for some reason they focus on the idea that police are there to help citizens, not to find them guilty of little infractions which, for the, which they have to pay money. Strange way to police. I know it's weird for all of you. Um, but the, it would make people a lot less scared of police if they knew that they, the average officer doesn't have a firearm. He's really there to lend his training and assistance, maybe in assistance to the cahoots people or the mental health people. Uh, and he can come there and just do crowd control or any number of things that you would need a typical police officer for uh, that isn't directly providing services to the person in mental distress or, uh, you know, a disagreement amongst neighbors. And uh, again, this would be a, the largest group of what's left of police of that. Let's call it 30 percent remaining. Uh, this would be 20 percent, maybe even 25 percent of the funding and the number of people. And they get to know people in their neighborhood. They are members of their community and they just uh they do traditional policing, not broken windows policing. That's a whole separate thing. And we'll get to that when we talk about systemic racism in a future uh, episode, but not broken windows policing, but actual like on the beat policing. And they'll leave everything else to the smallest group, that 5%, that 10% group. And that's going to be the armed police. Now, uh, again, kind of thinking about it, there would be a lot of these mental health or a lot of these uh, community members who are available to the public working the beats. There'd be less of the, the mental health providers. They'd have bigger districts, if you will, bigger areas to cover. Now, the unarmed police would be somewhere in the middle between the community leaders and the mental health professionals. They have bigger areas to cover, but also they're really there to be available to the citizenry. To, you know, they take calls and they go places, but they're really there a bit to say, hey, I can look at this person and trust that if I have if I have a need, they're there and available and they're there to help me not to, you know, shoot me in the face um, or uh, assault me because I am a black business owner who was robbed by a white guy. And when they show up, they assume the white robber is the business owner and the black man is the, the thief because, you know, systemic racism. But we'll get to that. That smallest group, the smallest group of all of these, uh, you know, I, I just try to give you some structure to, to imagine how big these sections are. The mediators are the largest. Somewhere between those two is the unarmed police. Then the mental health providers who are going to be less than the unarmed police, but have way more funding available. That funding would be available for programs, not necessarily boots on the ground. And then the smallest group is the unarmed police and or, I'm sorry, the armed police and the armed police will have an even smaller section that we would consider SWAT or, uh, you know, the, the super armed police. And they would be only taken out for very, very unique situations. Uh, I, I live in Hollywood now and in North Hollywood back in the early 2000s, there was a shootout between police and uh, some bank robbers where the bank robbers had AK-47s and body armor. This is a situation where we should bring out SWAT. These guys have are probably ex-military. They have military equipment and they use military tactics. And I never see them on the street. The only time I see them, the only time they leave, whatever location it is that they stage at, is when they're needed for specifically a situation that calls for them, where we need to have an equality amongst the bad guys, those who are breaking the social contract, and the good guys, the guys who are defending the social contract. Um, but something less than them would be armed police. And, you know, they don't carry around M16s. They don't have body armor. They're not looking like they're coming off the street of Basra rather than the street of Baltimore. But they do have firearms and maybe they do patrol the, the city. They're, they are out in cars. They're in they're covering bigger areas than, than the unarmed police. But they're available to provide support, whether that support is to the cahoots people or the mental health or the unarmed police. But if someone was to bring a firearm into a situation, they can create equality by bringing bringing a firearm there when they are requested by someone else who's providing services. And, and basically looking at that structure where the largest section is community mediation and programs to support it. Then we have a large section of mental health providers and programs to support them. And then a small section of unarmed police and even smaller section of armed police of which an even tinier section are SWAT and militarized police. And if you tie that structure in with what I've discussed previously about revamping the entire department, their policies, insurance, and all of that, I think that we would have a model for policing in the United States. And we can not worry about the things that we worry about now. Like, I'm the, the building manager at work. I essentially operate as facilities manager amongst many other things. And there was a, um, a I don't know the parlance, so forgive me, a homeless person, um, uh, but I know that's not the proper parlance today, um, who was basically bothering my employees as they came in. And I went over and I tried to have a discussion with him. And I was like, man, listen, like, you're going to make me do the thing that I don't want to do. I don't want to call the police. Number one, I have no one else to call. 
in my structure, obviously we would have someone else to call, but I don't have anyone else to call. And I'm looking at you and I'm seeing you're a person of color. And now you are making me possibly your judge, jury, and executioner. And I don't want that. But you're putting me in a situation where this is not about me. It's about my employees feeling unsafe and you doing something that is making them unsafe. And I can't do anything else but to call the police and to get, get the situation dealt with. That is a ripe situation for having a more, a better breakdown of this community services where I can call and say, hey, listen, there is a homeless gentleman and he's bothering some of my employees. I think he might be having a mental health problem, uh, but certainly he's homeless. So if you could send out some service people to help um, one to make my employees feel safer and, and also to help him through whatever crisis he's dealing with. And it's done. And I don't have to worry that the cop who's going to show up is going to say, take your hands out of your pockets. And when he doesn't going to shoot him. And now I'm responsible for that man's death. I don't see a flaw in this plan. And I am open to it. If you think that you have a, a, a you have a better idea, if I'm wrong here somewhere, um, listen, I, I will defend defunding the police fully. No matter what it is, I think we need to move money away from the police departments and back into the community in other ways. I don't think incremental change does it. I also don't think eliminating the police does it. I think this middle ground is is the safe place. It's where we ought to be. So if you disagree with me, let me know. Uh, you can send me an email to robexplainseverything at gmail.com. We'll have a contact page going up very shortly on robertandcheek.com forward slash REE. Uh, you can find the links uh, to Rob Explains Everything on the homepage there, just robertandcheek.com. Uh, no social media for the the this particular show yet. That'll be coming later, but you can find me on social media at Robert and Cheek. Uh, robertandcheek.com has links to all my stuff, but YouTube, I'm on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Twitch and everywhere at Robert and Cheek. Uh, YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash Rob Cheek. Uh, before I get out of here, I wanted to do a little bit on the 4th of July because it is 4th of July. And if you guys have been hanging around, thank you uh, for sticking around this long. Um, and again, if you have any final comments about this or uh, or anything else, it's 424-253-5606. That's 424-253-5606 to call in. Uh, I'm able to take your calls right here. Any comments, just let me know. But I want to talk a little bit about 4th of July because I think that this is the first 4th of July in a long time where many more people who look like me are feeling the way that I feel about this holiday. And this is a complex holiday. I want to celebrate it. Ideally, the United States is what everyone would hope it would become. Our founding fathers, flawed as they were, um, men of their time, you know, Thomas Jefferson saying all men are created equal while he held men in bondage uh, at Monticello. Yeah, it's complicated um, and none of it's good. But we have a constitutional document that continues to be changed and deal with the times. Unfortunately, we've reached a point in our history where that change just isn't coming and we are fighting against forces beyond our own. So for those of you who don't know, July 4th is the birthday of America and we call it, you know, that we celebrate that day because it is the day that the Declaration of Independence was adopted by the Constitutional Convention that actually probably happened on the 2nd or the 3rd, but it was made public on the 4th. So July 4th is the day we celebrate. July 4th is also the day that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams both died on the same day. John Adams' last words, um, Jefferson survives me, but he didn't. He had actually died earlier that day. Weird, weird things about history. We can get into that in a future episode if anybody's interested. Um, so, uh, one of the things that is part of the book that I'm drafting now is a new Declaration of Independence. And I wanted to read that for you guys just to give you an idea where my mind's at. Uh, essentially, I want to celebrate July 4th. I know this country at this point and the, its situation is not necessarily worth celebrating. For most people of color, July 4th has been a day that's a reminder that uh, the people who founded the country did not uh, did not care about them and did not treat them as equal. And so it is a lot of... And also, by the way, we live in a world where July 4th is a holiday, but Juneteenth isn't. Um, luckily, my company is now treating Juneteenth as a holiday. I, it should be a federalized holiday. We should make Juneteenth a holiday repeating every single year, um, just like we should make Election Day, by the way, a holiday so people have the day off. But uh, essentially what I argue in this book uh, is that the United States needs a new birth of freedom which uh, are Abraham Lincoln's words, of course. Uh, and we need to go back to where the founding fathers were, where their mentality was. Uh, I got to watch Hamilton yesterday for the first time. Never seen it on stage, but I watched it on Disney+. Plus. I highly recommend it. It just got me in this mindset of like, that dude wrote like he was running out of time. And I used to do that. I need to do that more. Uh, but I have essentially drafted a new declaration, a uh, new declaration of independence, one where all of us 
who believe, if you believe as I believe, if you think that the country is broken and that it needs to be repaired, then this is something we can all sign into. We can all agree with and we can move forward. And it uses some flowery language, but I try to bring it down so that it's understandable by everybody. So uh, I guess without further ado, uh, a new declaration of independence, of course, written by me. Whew, here we go. A new declaration. As time passes, it becomes necessary for the people to demand the redistribution of power, which has, for some time, been taken from the many and reserved for the few. At that time, it is only right that they demand the station with which the laws of this nation entitle them. A measure of respect to all requires that they clarify the causes and reasons which require the action. We, the people, hold these truths to be self-evident. All people are created equal. Their mere existence provides them with certain undeniable rights among, but not only these, are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To secure these rights against threats foreign and domestic, governments are in created by the people. Their just and limited powers derive from the consent of the people. Whenever any form of government created by the people becomes destructive of those purposes for which it was created, it is the right and duty of those people to alter or abolish it. They must then create a new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its authority in such form as to secure those undeniable rights. Cautiousness will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for unimportant and short-sighted causes. History has shown that people are more disposed to suffer while abuses are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the governments to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses pursuing inevitably the fit same goal reveal a design to submit the people under absolute despotism, it is the right of the people and their duty to throw off those shackles and to provide new guards for their future security. This has been the patient suffering of the people of the United States. Now, the necessity has been created which forces them to alter their current government. The history of the present oligarchy and their government puppets is a history of repeated injuries, all having the direct goal to establish an absolute tyranny over the people. To prove this, let facts be submitted to all. The elected officials are at this time organizing large armies of police and National Guard to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny, already begun with circumstances scarcely, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous of ages and totally unworthy of the heads of a civilized nation. The elected officials have maintained the systems of injustice rooted in racism, sexism, and discrimination defended by their fascist policies. The elected officials have altered fundamentally the forms of our governments. The elected officials have abolished our most valuable and protective laws. The legislatures have refused their assent to laws the most wholesome and necessary and for the good of the public. The elected officials have forbidden their... The oligarchs have forbidden their puppets to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance unless the passage can be suspended until their assent can be obtained. Once passage has been suspended, the legislatures have utterly neglected to attend to them. The legislatures have obstructed the administration of justice by refusing to assent to the appointments for the establishing of a working judiciary. The elected officials have erected a multitude of new offices and sent swarms of officers to harass our people and tax them into poverty. The elected officials have kept among us in times of peace, standing armies without the consent of the people. The elected officials have acted to render the military independent of and superior to the civil authority. The elected officials have continued large and unpopular wars on foreign soil, utilizing bodies of armed troops taken from their positions at home. The elected officials have incited domestic insurrections among us and have endeavored to bring upon the citizens of our nation at home and abroad terrorism. The elected officials have established free trade with all parts of the world, causing the removal of millions of jobs and billions in capital. The elected officials have imposed taxes on the majority of the citizens while removing taxes from the oligarchs and their businesses. The elected officials, controlled by the oligarchs, have plundered our seas, ravaged our coasts, raped our natural resources, and destroyed the lives of our people. In every stage of this oppression, we have petitioned for redress in the most humble terms. We have exercised those rights guaranteed to us by law. Our, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. Leaders whose character is marked by every act which might define a tyrant are unfit to be representatives of a free people. 
nor have we neglected in drawing the attention of our fellow citizens. We have warned them from time to time of attempts to extend an unwarrantable control and domination over us. We have reminded them of their rights as laid out by law. We have demonstrated the repeated abuses by the elected officials and their actors. We have appealed to their common goals, and we have begged them by the ties of our common history to disavow these actions, which would inevitably interrupt our connections. They, too, have been deaf to the voice of justice and to equity. We must, out of necessity, take the required actions and hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war and in peace, friends. We, therefore, the people... Appealing to the common sense of the majority for the righteousness of our intentions do, in the name and by the authority of the good people of this nation, solemnly publish and declare that the power of this nation shall be returned to the people from which it derives and that we are absolved from the illegal usurpation of this power. By this declaration, we shall take such action as may be necessary to accomplish this goal. And for the support of this declaration and with a firm reliance on the protection of law and history, we mutually pledge to each other our lives our fortune, and our sacred honor. Yeah, so a little long-winded, but uh, that's something, huh? Ooh, got a little, uh, mm, and one of those feelings where you're just like, ah, uh, shivers. So yeah, um, I hope you guys have enjoyed episode one. Rob explains everything. Uh, we're going to get into systemic racism, institutional racism on the next episode. After that, who knows? Uh, when we get back around to November 5th, I'll probably do yet another episode about Guy Fawkes because I really enjoy the story of Guy Fawkes and how he became kind of a pop culture icon. Uh, I've been asked questions recently about the multiverse, the super string theory and uh, alternate universes and all that kind of stuff. I'd be happy to jump into an episode about that. Uh, I actually have a survey coming. It's on uh, the website, robertandcheek.com forward slash R-E-E, um, or you can click the link to Rob Explains Everything. Uh, let me know what topics you would like to hear about. For every single episode, we're going to have the call in. The number will always be the same. That number, of course, is 424-253-5606. Once again, 424-253-5606. You can call in to be part of the show. Taking comments, taking questions. If you see this video after it's been posted, feel free to put your comments and questions down in the bottom. Happy to do a recap video or a reaction video and just kind of address any of the questions or any of the things I might have missed. Any alternative plans, I'd love to do that for you. So if you have anything else, follow it up with me. Just let me know. For right now, though, this is going to be the end of episode one, version four, of Rob Explains Everything. Thank you guys for joining me. Uh, I've had a fantastic time doing it, and uh, I'm looking forward to doing it next time. Uh, looking forward to your questions, your reactions. Let me know your thoughts. Uh, we got new parody songs coming up in the next few weeks. We got a lot of projects under, under works. Uh, make sure you check out the OD Anthem podcast, new episode of that show every Tuesday. We record live on Mondays all over the internet. You can catch us there. Uh, all those links are available at robertandcheat.com as well. So go and find those. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. It's been a very much longer than I thought it was going to be, but uh, I'm glad to have spent a little bit of my July 4th with all of you, and I hope you can say the same. Until next time, take care of yourselves and each other, and have a great week, everybody.